morning, church. Good morning. So glad to see everybody here this morning. I want to welcome you to our worship service. Uh, before we begin, I, I've got several announcements, but I also want to share a, a letter we received uh, from the family of Miss Kathy Kuntz. Uh, and it says, Church, thank you so much for everything you've done to support our family. We truly appreciate all of the meals, prayers, visits, and love. Thank you for making her service in the Family Life Center amazing and beautiful. It was a true reflection of the life she lived. Please continue to pray for us uh, with love, the family of Miss Kathy Kuntz. So, Church, I want to encourage you to continue to pray for them in the, the days and weeks ahead and continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus and, and, uh, and to extend the right hand of Christian fellowship to them. Uh, folks, there's a lot going on in the life of our church. We're so glad you're here. Uh, I, I want to encourage you to take a minute and go ahead and read your bulletin. There's a whole bunch of announcements in there, but uh, just a couple that I want to share uh, that are of, 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 of immediate need and need your immediate attention. Uh, we have a middle school skate uh, that's going on this afternoon, so students in middle school, if you want to join together for a time of fellowship and go roller skating, uh, we're going to meet today at 2 o'clock uh, at the roller rink, so we're just going to meet there. You have to provide your own transportation. Uh, but uh, Mr. Ron and Miss Katie will be there. That's going to be at 2 o'clock today for middle school students. Uh, immediately at the conclusion of this service today, uh, if you have a child who's in the 3rd through 5th grade and you're interested in, in uh, more information about a summer camp opportunity, we're sending a group of kids to Century Kid uh, this summer. Uh, and immediately following this service uh, in here, Pastor Stevens going to meet with those parents uh, to give you more information about Century Kid summer camp. Uh, that's for uh, kids who are currently in the third through the fifth grade. Um, several weeks ago, we started a, a weekly Bible study where we've been working through the book of James, and we've been meeting at 10 o'clock on Tuesday mornings, and that's gone great. However, there's been several folks that have wished that we had another opportunity, so ask and ye shall receive, right? Um, we're doing the same study twice on Tuesday, so if you're not available on Tuesday mornings uh, at 10 o'clock, we're also doing the same Bible study on Tuesday afternoons at 3 p.m. So uh, it's open to anybody who wants to come. You can come at 10, you can come at 3, come to both if you want some extra Jesus. Uh, but come on, we'd love to have you. We're doing that every Tuesday in the Fellowship Hall at 10 o'clock and at 3 o'clock. Um, we are having Parents' Night Out uh, coming up very soon in a couple weeks. That will be on March the 5th. Uh, we still do need a couple of volunteers. So if you'd be willing to, uh, to serve for a couple hours on a Friday night, taking care of some kids and doing activities and things of that nature, uh, I want to encourage you to reach out, let us know in the church office, or you can talk to Alyssa McFarling, uh, and she can get you plugged in. Uh, and lastly, before we begin our worship service today, I just want to share an update uh, from our associate pastor search committee. Um, we appreciate your prayers. There's been a lot of work, and we've, we've had hundreds of resumes. Uh, we've done questionnaires and interviews, and uh, we feel the Lord leading us, and, and we've we're narrowed down to one candidate. He's uh, excited about coming here and meeting you guys. You're going to have some more details about that in the very near future as we kind of work out the logistics of what that looks like, meeting him with COVID and all of that stuff. But you'll get more information about him uh, and his family in the coming days, so we're really excited about that. Uh, please keep our committee uh, and him in our prayers as, as we move forward and um, extending a call for him to serve as our next fellowship and outreach pastor. Uh, that is it for announcements. The rest of them, pay attention to your bulletin. You didn't come here to hear business. You came here to, to encounter the King of Kings. So as we do that, I'm going to ask if you would join me in a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts to do just that. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of this Lord's Day and the awesome privilege that we have to, to come together at this time and in this place uh, for, the, for the sole purpose of offering you praise and adoration. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to fill this place. Uh, God, transform us today as we encounter your word, as we encounter your presence, as we, we sing your praises and glorify you. May you use this time to mold us and shape us into the people that you've saved us to be and to, to, into the church that you've established us to be. God, we love you. We thank you. And we offer this prayer in the perfect name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. People, let's stand. Let's sing together this morning. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me And I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood that told me And I repented of my sin And one of the Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. And He loved me ere I knew Him, 
Say, I heard. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealed. He made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. And he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption song. And some sweet day I'll sing up there. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. And he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is true. He plunged me to victory. Victory beneath the cleansing flood. I'm in church. Sing, I count. Because I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Sing it again. Say, I count on one thing. I count on one thing. The same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the way The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Oh, yeah. You high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will, and I choose to pray. Glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against, and I 
choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, that nothing can stand against. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, that nothing can stand against. Oh, yes, I will lift you high. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. church. You guys may take a seat for just a quick moment. And as you guys are finding your seat, if you pull out a copy of God's Word with you and turn with me to 2 Corinthians. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word, one thing that we do offer here, if you're looking for a Bible or need one, we have them for you. So when you guys come in, we have them on our welcome stations, both here and in the vestibule. Um, but if you don't have one with you, immediately the Word will be on our screens. Um, but let's look at 2 Corinthians we're going to be at the end of chapter 5. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is where we're going to begin. But Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, Jesus, or in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be no sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And folks, today we um, are excited. We're starting a new sermon series called Unveiled, and this is kind of the preface, and Pastor Mike's going to talk a lot more to it, but this is the preface to, to prepare us for Easter, if you can believe it or not. Um, and, and what we're going to look at today is, is the gospel through creation. And um, the reason I wanted us to read this scripture together is the same God who set the stars in the sky, who created the earth, who created this creation, as we read in verse 17, has the power to take old, broken, sin-filled hearts and make them his new creation, set on fire for his gospel, for his word, saved through his blood. Um, and so, folks, let's pray together, and we're going to continue to sing to the Lord. Father God, we, we praise you for your love. We thank you for um, the scripture and this time we can come together and focus ourselves on you. Lord, we exalt your name today. Father, move among us, I pray, Lord, that you would send your spirit in this place, and we would be able to encounter you in, 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 in wonderful ways, Father. So draw us closer to you, to your precious hand that we pray. Amen. So church, let's stand. Let's continue to sing together. Amazing love that welcomes me. The kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserved sing this chorus let's sing God oh God you're so good oh God you're so good oh God you're so good you're so Behold the cross.
so good, so good. Oh, God, you're so good. Oh, God, you're so good. Oh, God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Sing it again. Sing, God. Oh, God, you're so good. Yes, you are, Lord. God, you're so good. So good. Oh, God, you're so good. You're so good to me. I am blessed. I am called. I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, and filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. I am blessed, I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole. I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, and filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. This life brings suffering, Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me, both now and forever. Oh God, you're so good. God, you're so good. Oh, God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Oh, my God, you're so good. Oh, God, you're so one more time together. Sing God. Oh God, you're so good. And God, you're so good. Oh God, you're so good. You're so good to is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest strength, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. 
Sing that again. Sing my hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let your voice sing in Christ alone. Christ alone, the cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness darkness seems to hide his face I rest I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale he's my anchor my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within Christ alone, Christ alone, the cornerstone, weak man strong, in the Savior's love, through the storm, He is the Lord, Lord shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone and faultless stand before the throne sing to him this morning sing Christ alone in Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Father God, we praise you this morning. Thank you for this time we've been able to, to worship your great name. Father, we come before you now asking Lord to continue to prepare our hearts to dive into your scripture. Because Father, what a wonderful thing it is to open your word. And Father, I pray that our hearts will be open. Would you give us the knowledge to comprehend and understand the best that we can, Father, what it means that we're about to study through. And Father God, we thank you that it ultimately all points back to you and our need for a Savior. And we're thankful for that Savior that was sent for us. So God, we love you. We praise you as our cornerstone this morning. Upon everything that we say and do, may it reflect your goodness, your grace. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated this morning. I'm kids, uh, fifth grade and under, if you'd like to go to Children's Church, you can exit out those double doors. Parents, they will be in the uh, fellowship hall today, and you can pick them up at the conclusion of the service. Uh, everyone else, I, I want to invite you to go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 2 today. Uh, and before we begin uh, and, and dive into this text, I, I want to share a story uh, from Luke chapter 24. As Pastor Stephen said earlier, and you've noticed it, in your bulletins, and I've been announcing this. We're starting a, a new sermon series today uh, called Unveiled, the Gospel in the Old Testament. And the reason we're doing that is, is I want to take some time to uh, really understand and prepare ourselves to celebrate Easter. And there's a story in, in the Bible, in Luke chapter 24, that happens post-resurrection uh, that I want to share that kind of 
uh, illustrates my desire for, for preaching what I'm going to be preaching today and leading up to Easter. And, and it's a story of, of Jesus encountering two folks, uh, two of his disciples on the, on the Emmaus road, on the road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13, says this, That very day two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They went, they were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back, saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And this is an interesting story. It happens post-resurrection. You know, these were followers of Jesus who didn't get Easter. And, and, and we got to cut them a little slack because it was, it was still new. They were still fleshing this out. But Jesus has a conversation with them. And rather than starting with his resurrection, starting at Easter Sunday, it says in verse 27, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. In other words, Jesus went back to the beginning of the Bible to tell his story. He, he went back when he says all the way to Moses. That's the first five books of our Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Jesus went back there to tell all the things in scripture concerning himself. And folks, that's what I want us to do as a church leading up to Resurrection Sunday. I want to take some time to talk about these stories in the Old Testament that taken on their own, there's a lot of truth in there, but when we interpret them and we look at them through the lens of the resurrection, what we see very clearly is that before God sent His Son to save the world, He unveiled His plan to do just that. From the very beginning. There's the, the gospel is in the Old Testament. And we're going to take some time over the next six Sundays to kind of unpack this and, and see how grand God's vision is. Church does not start on Easter Sunday. Our faith does not start on Easter Sunday. God in His sovereignty from the very beginning has been unfolding this plan before our very eyes. And folks, we're going to do Easter big here at First Baptist Church. We're, we're going to do it big. We're, we're going to celebrate. It's going to be great. We're going to have Holy Week services, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're going to take these next six Sundays and we're going to be talking about the gospel in the Old Testament, paving the way for Jesus to come. And then on, on Holy Week, on Wednesday night, we're going to celebrate the advent, the birth, the arrival of Jesus in the flesh. And then Thursday of Holy Week, we're going to celebrate and reflect on his life and his ministry. On Friday, we're going to look at his atoning death on the cross and, and what that means. The first day of his death. On Saturday, we'll have silence. We'll have nothing as a church. The second day. And on the third day, Easter Sunday, get ready. Because we're going to come and we're going to celebrate the glory of resurrection. But Easter at First Baptist Church starts right now. Easter at First Baptist Church of Richland starts right now because we are going to prepare our hearts beginning today to see the gospel in the Old Testament. Folks, my hope and my prayer as we look at creation and the, and the creation story is that we're going to see what God is doing and unfolding even here in the very beginning. The Old Testament reveals God as the creator of all things. And the gospel reveals that through Jesus we are born again. We're a new creation. 
God, God is going to lay that foundation from the very beginning of Genesis. And we're going to unpack that today. Now folks, we're going to be looking at all of Genesis chapter 2 today. But I'm going to kind of break it up in chunks. So uh, we're not going to stand and read the entire passage uh, to start. We're going to read the first seven verses. But as we start, I will ask if you are able, please stand with me out of reverence for the reading of God's holy word. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 2 and read verses 1 through 7 together. Where it is written, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished His work that He had done. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all His work that He had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, there was no man, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the gift of your word. And as we take time today to, to breathe in the truth that you've uh, breathed out through Moses, uh, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would unlock our understanding. Lord, help us to see things through your eyes. And Lord, as, as we focus on this text today to prepare for Easter, help us to, to focus ourselves in a way that it points to Jesus. God, we know your word does just that. Lord, as you've unveiled your gospel, the good news of salvation that you've offered freely by your grace through faith in your son Jesus, as you lay the foundation for that, open our eyes to see that and to see you in your omniscience and your glory. God, we love you and thank you in Jesus' holy and perfect name. Amen. Please be seated. So when we look at these first seven verses, and we just look at, at this account of creation, of course Genesis 1 uh, has, a, has a creation account as well, but when we look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, we see something. And we need to understand it, we need to wrap our brains around it, because God reveals something to us. And that is this, God demonstrates His power to create. God demonstrates his power to create. In fact, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. The entirety of creation in six magnificent and glorious days, God did something profound from nothing. He created everything that was in existence. And how did he do it? When, when we, when, Genesis chapter 2 doesn't tell us too much detail. Genesis chapter 1 does. And we see a phrase that's repeated over and over again. And God said, let there be, and there was. We see our, our creator God creating through the power of his word. He spoke creation into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let there be an expanse above and, and waters below, and it happened. He said, he said, let there be dry land in the midst of the sea. So he parted the waters and made seas and dry land. He hung the stars and the moon in the sky. He did this glorious work by speaking creation into existence. And what we know about creation at this point in the story is that it was good. Indeed, it was very good. That's what it says at the end of Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. When, when God declares something to be good, He's declaring it to be pure, to be undefiled, to be holy, if you will. And, and what God had done in His sovereignty in the very beginning, from nothing, He created something that was remarkably good and pleasing to Him. God shows in, in, in just this short few words, He demonstrates to us that He and He alone has the power to create, to make things. But folks, if that was the end of it, then, then he, he would just be a, a God who created things, stuff, right? But there's more to it. Not only did God create things and demonstrate his power which is which is remarkable what we also see in the next verses is that God uniquely has the ability to give life to his creation not only does God create 
He demonstrates His power to give life to that which He created. Let's look at at Genesis chapter 2 starting in verse 7, picking it up. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. From the dust that He created, from nothing, He formed man. And it says, And breathed into His nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The first, the name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now folks, when we look at this, we see God bringing to life that which was lifeless. He had created this world, and from the dust of the ground He formed man. And man was laying there. All his parts were there. He was completely intact. He he, he looked exactly the way God wanted him to look, but he was lifeless until God took action. And it says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Only God can do that. Folks, man can't do that. We can't replicate that. Only God can. Life is is literally, by the word of God, it is God-breathed. So so we see God demonstrating His his ability and His power to give life to that which He created. We see the garden come to life. You know, He had formed the land and the the seas and the dry land and and the vegetation. But look what happens. God planted a garden. He brought that land to life. He made it flourish. He, He brought trees to life that were both pleasant for the sight and enjoyable, a good view and beautiful scenery but also that were good for food. Food, that which is necessary for sustaining life, was provided in God's sovereignty by His hand for for His creation. He's bringing life. He brought fresh water in the form of of rivers to flow through the dry land, life-sustaining, life-giving fresh water. So, So through this story, we see God demonstrating His power to create and to give life to that which he has created, but he's still not done in creation. There's more that he's going to do, and what we see in the next verses, 15 through 25, is God demonstrates his power to establish relationships. He he makes creation to interact with one another. He makes creation to interact with him in his sovereignty and his goodness. God establishes relationships. Look what happens in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you surely shall die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Women, you can relate to that, right? It's not good for the man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. 
what we see repeated in, in this portion of the story is God establishing relationships. We see a relationship between God and man. You know, God is the creator, man is the, is the created, right? And, and, and the Lord God has dominion over all things as the creator. He has dominion over man. He has the dominion and the ability to put that man where he wills him to go. He literally takes that man and puts him in the garden to tend it, to keep it, to work, to work it. He, God establishes a relationship by which he holds man who was created in his image, right? Human beings are created in the image of God. It, it says that in Genesis 1, 26, for let us make man in our own image, in our likeness, let us create him. And he creates them, male and female, he created them. Well, here, God holds man accountable to his standards as an image bearer. He says, I'm going to give you everything you need. And God starts to issue commands and says, you can have anything you want, but don't eat of this. If you do, there's consequences. And God is establishing a relationship between him and man. We see uh, God establishing a relationship between man and the rest of creation. Yeah, he, gave, he gave man stewardship over all that God created. God didn't give all the creatures and things names. He allowed man the grace to do that. He, he presented at the apex of all that he created, his image bearers. He, he presented and man had the ability to name things. He gave human beings dominion over and stewardship over all that God created. It's a remarkable relationship. He established relationship between human beings. Man was no longer alone. Bad things happen when men are alone. So he created a, a woman to go, along, to go along with him. Not greater than or less than, not superior or inferior, but different than man. To be a partner, to be a helper in, in man's dominion over all of creation. That is by the sovereign design of God. He's established relationships. And we see that laid out here in Genesis chapter 2. So here in the Old Testament, what do we see in the creation story? In the beginning, we see God revealing himself as the creator. He's demonstrated his power to, to be able to make things out of nothing, to create things that, 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 do, that had never existed before to create things and to, to give life to that which he created and, and establish relationships. This alone, the simple fact that God is the creator, should invoke a sense of awe and wonder in us. If that's all we knew about God, he would still be worthy of our worship and our praise because he's so good and so powerful. Literally, without him, there is nothing. Think about that. Everything that exists, exists simply because God demonstrated his power. You and I have, have great abilities. Don't get me wrong, we can make some cool stuff, right? We can take something and, and add something to it or cut it or shape it or mold it. We can make some really cool stuff. We have the ability to do that, to combine things, to craft things, right? What none of us has the ability to do is to create something from nothing. That's something that only God can do. We don't have the ability or power to be able to turn nothing into something. We're limited in ours. God is not. That is the doctrine of creation and the understanding that He is the creator, that only God has the ability to, to be able to create things from nothing. And that is a doctrine that we have to embrace to fully understand the glory of the gospel. The doctrine of creation. The Old Testament reveals that God is the creator of all things. And the gospel reveals to us that through Jesus we are born again. We're not just transformed. It's not that things get different and things get better. But behold, all things are new. We are a new creation. That can't be done on our own. Now, now we can affect life change. We can read five healthy steps to better eating. You know, we, we can change our habits. You know what we can't do? We can't make ourselves new. We can't make ourselves into a new creation. We have the ability to change, and we have the ability to change for the better or for the worse. But we don't have the ability to take something that doesn't exist and make it exist. Only 
God can do that. So in the beginning, we see God demonstrating his power to do that. And I would argue that from the beginning, God has started to unveil the foundation of the gospel that's to come. From the very beginning, as he reveals his power alone to create things that don't exist, lays the foundation for an understanding of what's going to happen when he sends his son to save the world, that in him, old things pass away and we are a new creature in Christ. We are, we are born again. God alone has that power. It's unveiled here all the way back in the beginning in Genesis. And folks, I want you to think about something. How does God bring that about? How does God in his word show us that he makes things new? How does God bring about creation? What is it that facilitates the power of God when it comes to create? How did God create? You know what the answer is? His word. The answer is his word. How does God create? He says, let there be, and there was. He, he literally speaks things into existence. It is the word of God that facilitates the power of God to create. How about this? What is it that God does to bring life to that which is lifeless? Man was formed. All his parts were there from the dust of the ground. God miraculously and in an awesome way formed man but he was dead he was lifeless what was it that God used to unlock his power to give life it was his breath he breathed into the man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being it was his word his word comes through breath it's the word of God the breath of God that that unlocks God's power and, and releases God's power to breathe life or give life to that which is lifeless. How about this? How is it that God established relationships with man? What did God do to establish relationships? It's the same answer. It's his word. He gave commands. He gave instructions. He spoke things into existence. He gave man stewardship over, over creation. It is by the power of God's word that we see God use to bring about new, to bring about new life, new creation. John would affirm this in his gospel. Gospel of John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. He uses the same exact words that we see in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, in the beginning, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John just said in two sentences what I've been trying to say this entire time I've been up here. It is because of the Word of God. It is because of the Word of God that anything exists at all. Apart from that, there is nothing it, it, is, it is the way God unleashes his power is by the word, by his word. Now go to the Gospel of John chapter 1 and go down a few verses to verse 14 and look what happens to that word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The power of God to bring about new to create, to give life, to establish relationships was manifest in flesh. The fullness of God took on flesh. You know who that is? He has a name, and it's Jesus. Jesus is God. Uh, don't miss that. Well, the very first story I, I read today, talking about those disciples on the, on the road to Emmaus, as Jesus is talking to them, he's not talking to them as a prophet who is mighty in deed and works as they considered in their own minds. We thought he was our savior. We thought he was going to be the one to, to redeem Israel. He can't, a human being can't do that. Only God can. And Jesus is revealed to be God in the flesh. That's the glory of the resurrection. So, so, so we, need to, we need to understand that Jesus is not just a prophet. He is the Word incarnate. He is the Word that became flesh. Without Him, there is nothing. 
Without Him, there's no Christianity. Without Him, we can't possibly be born again. And if we're not born again, according to Jesus, according to the Word of God in the flesh, if we're not born again, we will never see the kingdom of God. That's John chapter 3, verse 3. We look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Pastor Stephen read this earlier today in part of this, in part of this service. In Christ, we are a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Folks, we can't do that. We can't be good enough. We can't give enough tithes and offerings. We can't come to church enough. We can't do enough Bible study. We can't do that. We can't make ourselves a new creation. Only God can. And praise be to God, because of His grace, He has offered us the, the opportunity to receive it by putting our faith and trust in Jesus. He draws us unto salvation. He gives us an opportunity, and that's what we celebrate. We see in the beginning God unveiling what was to come. From, you know, don't, don't miss that. Jesus says in John 5, 39, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have everlasting life, and these are they which bear witness of, to me. As we, as we read the story of creation in Genesis chapter 2, millennium before Jesus would actually arrive in the flesh and take on flesh, we see God telling us it's going to happen. He's saying, watch this, I bring new life. I make things new. I do it by my word. And centuries pass, and centuries pass, and centuries pass. And in the fullness of time, when the time was exactly right, God sent His Son. He sent His Word to, to bring about a, a revitalization amongst the lost world, to, to save us, to save our souls. And, and folks, you can't receive that. You can't be part of the gospel story. You can't celebrate the resurrection without realizing that He is the Word incarnate and celebrating Him. Apart from Jesus, there is no gospel. Apart from Jesus Christ, there is no gospel. I know there's a, a saying out there that, you know, go out there and, and share the gospel, use words if you have to. That's a bunch of hogwash. You can't share the gospel without telling people about Jesus. <laughs> it's okay to do good works. We should do good works. Our, our works should bear witness to our faith. But apart from Jesus, there is no gospel. Apart from the word, there is no life. So folks, as we have a time of invitation today, Let's celebrate that truth. A lot of you are sitting here today and you're reading this, this creation story through a new lens for the first time. Let me tell you something. Every time you read God's word, he's going to speak something to you. Stories that we've heard for our entire lives, maybe. The, the story of creation. Maybe you've never seen it through this lens before. Would you thank God for that? It, it's his living and enduring word, his written word, his incarnate word. God uses that to draw us nearer to his presence. So folks, as we have a time to respond today, if you are a believer, would you praise God for his word? Would you just thank him simply for being a God who sees things beyond which we couldn't possibly comprehend? From the very beginning, God showed us he was going to send Jesus. From the very beginning, he lays that foundation. That's the God we serve. That's the God who saves us. That God who knows all things is limitless in knowledge, limitless in power. Let's celebrate him today. Let's worship him. Let's offer ourselves to him completely again, renewed and refreshed as a church. Let's do that. Maybe you're sitting here today and realizing you're on the outside looking in. That this whole Bible thing, this whole Christian thing, this whole church thing is way deeper than you gave it credit for. And you're ready to be part of what God's doing. And you're ready to be part of this gospel story that God's laying the foundation for in Genesis. I got good news for you folks. If you're ready to receive that and be part of what God's doing, if you want to be born again and made new, to have your old sinful life pass away, and to be raised to a newness of life, and as we sing this next song together, would you come forward and let me pray the gospel with you? Let's celebrate how, how God is drawing you unto salvation. There is one way to the Father, and that's through the Son. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to Him. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus, the incarnate Word. The Word of God is that which gives us new life. 
Apart from Him, there is nothing. Apart from the Word, nothing is there. So you can embrace that today. And if you need to make that decision or if you've made that decision and you're ready to, to take that next step in faith and, 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 and be baptized and to, uh, to join a, a, a church, then, then as we sing this next song, come forward and let me talk with you about that. Folks, I don't know what the Lord's leading you to do today, but I do know that the God of this Bible, the God who, who, who painstakingly and in great detail divinely inspired a man by the name of Moses to write these exact words so that we could see the story of salvation unfold from the very beginning, that God has a plan for you. That God has a desire for you to know Him and to love Him. And if He's drawing you unto salvation today, then let nothing stand in your way. Come forward. Make this place your altar, church. It's open. I don't know what you need to bring before Him, but know this, God is a God of new. And we celebrate that. We rejoice in that today. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of this day and just how awesome it is, God, to be able to, to look into your word and to see the gospel story unfold from the very beginning. Lord, it, it just never ceases to amaze us how limitless your knowledge is. We're so grateful that you've given us your written word. A word that, 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 that gives us direction, a, a grand revelation of yourself and your desire for us as, as your created people. A written word that points us directly to the incarnate word, to your son Jesus. God, we, we rejoice in that. We celebrate that. And God, it is my prayer as we stand here today that your Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of us. That God, whether you're drawing us unto salvation or you're drawing us to, to, to revel and celebrate in your gospel or you're calling us as believers to share your gospel. It is my prayer right now that your Holy Spirit would convict each and every one of us and that we'd be willing to say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. And we'd be willing to follow you wherever you lead us. God, as we have a time of response today, may we be still and celebrate that you, in fact, are the Lord of creation today. God, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll stand and respond this morning. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son. A wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one brings many sons to glory Behold a man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there. Until it was accomplished, his dying breath has brought me alive. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, His word have paid my ransom why should i gain from his reward 
I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. take a seat and remain there till one of our ushers comes and, uh, and gets you to, to, um, to exit our sanctuary or our family life center here and uh, keeping our social distance and things of that nature. Folks, we're so glad you chose to, uh, to join us for worship here at First Baptist Church. Uh, if you're a first time guest today, I want to encourage you to stop by our welcome center uh, before you leave. We have some information about our church and for, uh, would like to get some information that we can get to know you a little bit better. But folks, we're glad each and every one of you are here. As we go, let's go with a word of prayer together. Father in heaven, thank you uh, for the gift of, of, of this day. Uh, we're so thankful for the opportunity to know you and to love you. And God, that's possible because you've established relationships. Lord, we're, we're just stand humbled and, and in awe of you, a God who is infinitely and abundantly able to, to make yourself knowable and to make yourself known. And God, as we depart from this place, may we be mindful uh, of your power, of your omniscience, of your omnipotence. Uh, Lord, as we leave from here today, may the things we say and do reflect your glory and goodness so that everybody we encounter might see you in us. And all God's people said, Amen.